Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, your guide to traveling, investing, and living beyond borders, where we talk about living the life that you want to live where you want to live it. All right, today I have with me Ka Sundance, and he is a location independent father of six, YouTuber, and CEO of a million heart centered online business. Together with his wife, Katie, he works to show aspiring business owners, coaches, and artists how to transform their lives and manifest more purpose, abundance, and freedom. He's originally from Germany. Kai and Katie started their life together on welfare, $15,000 in debt, and working three combined jobs around the clock just to make ends meet for their family. When one of their children got sick, they found the magic of health-conscious foods and began creating YouTube videos and eBooks to teach others how to become healthy. This started their online business journey and has allowed them the financial freedom to travel the world as a family ever since. Today, Ka and Katie have impacted millions of people on Facebook and YouTube with more than 500,000 Facebook fans and 70,000 YouTube subscribers and have helped and inspired thousands of people to go from zero to six figures in revenue by using principles they teach in their flagship program, Online Business School. Ka, thanks uh, for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so much, James. I'm very pleased to have that you have me on. Thank Great. you so much. So where are you joining us from today? Well, today we just arrived like two weeks ago. We arrived um, back in our um, chosen like, um, you know, base camp in Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. Costa Rica. Um, okay. so, so right now I'm sitting really directly on the beach in my favorite uh, health food restaurant um, <laughs> by the beach. Um, and um, I'm very pleased and happy to talk to you and yeah. inspire some people, hopefully. The real digital nomad uh, lifestyle there. Yeah, that, that's, that's that's right. And doing this with six kids, yeah. There you go. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, you know, I've had a lot of different, uh, you know, the quote unquote digital nomad types uh, on the show. Um, what you don't see a lot of is people that travel with uh, their family, and you have a, a quite large family there with with six kids, and you've been doing it for a while, nonstop traveling. Um, it's one of the the one of the biggest uh, things I get questions or drawbacks when people say, "Oh, you know, I can never do that," or "I have to wait," or you know, about going to a place that they know they want to go or you know traveling a bit is is the uh, aspect of the the family and the kids and stuff like that so uh, maybe you could just uh you know tell us how were you able to uh to do that with with the kids first of all how how could you uh was that not a big shock at first for your for your children to to get into this type of lifestyle and how are you able to manage that well, I have to ask the other way around. How how could you not do that? It's just you know so much fun to travel around the world with your right. kids and be in beautiful, beautiful locations. And um, I get this question asked a lot. And I have to get back to you, um, and you know to everybody who does not understand that this is not something that we all of a sudden it came over us and we just started to become world travelers. You know, I was I made I made the decision to become a world traveler when I was like six or seven years old when I was a little child and I was in holiday with my mom and my dad at the time and just had this beautiful time and my mom was relaxed and we had time and it was just everything was so new and exciting and this is when I decided I want to become like a world traveler Mm. and then of course I went through my school career but even you know during my high school when I was like 16, 17 years old I was starting to hitchhike all around Europe by myself um, in the summer vacation so Mm -hmm. um, I started even as a teenager already, and then I did my first big travel, um, intercontinental travel, um, right after high school. It was 1995, 22 years ago, to Costa Rica, mm. all by myself. I was going there, and then two years later, after my civil service in Germany, I just uh, went on a big travel, like half a year around the world travel with my best friend at the time, and I met my my wife, Katie. Um, in the sandy shores of New Zealand. So I was literally flying all around the world to meet my, my soul partner and um, my soul flame, Katie, and we met, it was 20 years ago. So you have to see that even the foundation of our relationship before, even years before we had children, was based on you know traveling, meeting at the other side of the world. Wow. You know, And then um, we traveled just by ourselves. This is when we founded our family. That was 1999, 2000, 2001, we traveled. Um, uh, uh, Katie and I, and then you know we discovered in the uh, Peru in per- in the Andes of Peru, we discovered that we that she's pregnant, that we will have our first child, and so it goes on, you know. So mm. so we always have been traveling. There was, and we did this without money, without education, without support, um, you know, not having you know anything basically. But this was just a decision we made. We just always liked it this way, and we never were really thinking too much about. How, how how can we do this? How right. are we allowed to do this? Is this you know? Do we need to get permission by somebody, or 
we just wanted to do it and we mm -hmm. did it and we did it without money with kids with no kids and it makes no difference to us that's great and uh, just curious what part of germany are you from we both come it's also interesting enough that we really just live lived back you know 20 years ago um mm -hmm. we just lived maybe like uh, 45 minutes apart from each other so she okay. comes from the big city Stuttgart. okay it's a big city you know to our knowledge and i'm more a country boy all right so um but again we met in new zealand and yeah we yeah, both cool. come from the southern part of germany yeah i did a lot of uh backpacking as well when i was in in college in europe and i, I spent some time in in germany and a lot in, in munich i uh, really enjoyed it there um, yeah, so that, so that's interesting. So, uh, when you started your business, uh, so then you didn't have all your kids then uh, when you really started uh, hardcore traveling, correct? Um, yeah, exactly. Like we we started way before I was together with Katie. I started with Katie way before we had children. So this was way before then. The business was at the very end. So we even were traveling, having no business, and we're in depth and on social benefits. Mm. The business just came in later, basically. Two thousand nine, we started the business. So it was out of uh, kind of a necessity or, or desperation. You said, "Oh man, we got to we got to put something together here, right?" Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because you know, I'm just a very simple carpenter. You know, I don't have any fancy education. I don't have any par parents that would support me, especially not with these weird um, hobbies we uh, had and we still have. And now, now they're big supporters. Now, as we are very successful, they are all of a sudden they turn into first time supporters. But believe me, one thing, they were not. <laughs> they were yeah. not. We were very alone in the first years and they, they were like suffering from us. And I can understand because we went, you know, on, you know, on a world travel with two kids and we had like, you know, two, three hundred bucks to our name. And we started and we had no idea yeah. where more money, more money would come in or any of that sort. So. And we, we did this for ma many years, we did that. And then we also returned back to Europe to do some jobs. Like you said in the introduction, we were working three jobs, um, basically 24 seven. And we still, on top, you know, we were working those three jobs. We didn't see each other and we had to receive additional support from the government mm -hmm. because we couldn't afford to buy food for, for our children. Right. And when we did this for a while, we then just realized, man, this cannot go on. This is, and then we realized also there is no way out of this trap. If you're going to stick to our ethical jobs we were doing, I was working in the hospice, um, you know, um, accompanying people who were dying basically, you know, the next couple of days. My wife was working in the health food store. It was good, at, uh, like um, ethical, high standard jobs, but they were so underpaid. And we realized if we're going to be sticking to those jobs, that we're going to be doomed to poverty for the right. rest of our days. And this was when we decided, okay, we have to change something. And this is when the first time we really were thinking about creating a business and just making our own luck, you right. know, be responsible for our own luck and not trying to depend on like government or mm -hmm. some somebody to help us. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's something that people definitely need to get over as far as you're saying that, you know, this uneasy feeling of when you first uh, get started in kind of an entrepreneurial journey, there's really no way around it. You, you know, it, it's not going to be a, a smooth, easy ride. It's going to be bumpy. You're going to be worried about, uh, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? You got everything riding on this. And, um, you know, you just got to, to motivate through that and, uh, and tr you know, try your best to make it work, you know. And, um, That's right, yeah. And, and I think that, uh, in, you know, in today's world, people definitely need to learn how to do that because the idea of just having, a, you know, the same career all your life and then, you know, being able to, uh, retire and all that, uh, and and just have a a good life uh, without, um, you know, doing anything entrepreneurial. It's, it's not gonna not gonna work at least for for my generation. Yeah, and for a lot of people, you know, for my people that might work if you have a great education or you have like you know connections in yeah. the you know right. the business world or something, it might work. But it's just a very small amount of people this is working for. And then also, you know, it's, I'm still you know representing, I believe, not the majority of people. It's still just you know if you know not everybody is cut out for this. Some people are just happy to have a boss and have a like a like a paycheck they can rely on and have like you know eight or five. But you know, at five o'clock you just walk out. There and you know nobody's bothering you anymore that's all fine you know if you're happy with this kind of life then you don't have to you know 
keep on listening to me or you, you know this is not this is not for everybody right. but for those people who don't like to have a boss and just receive orders yeah. and being like chronically underpaid and and do something they're not f with their full heart and soul behind if people like know that there is they can expect more from life than just doing a stupid job nine to five and having like an underpaid paycheck if people you know are not happy with this then they should be listening because we are we are people who um, took matters in our own hands I was not I was just not unhappy with it like a lot of people are I was willing to do something against that and you know and I think this is the crucial point here are you willing to accept a reality for yourself that is just leaving you with a, a pale feeling of um, you know um, security um, but an unhappy security you're not happy with this you know if and, and if you if you're not happy with this what what are you willing to do against it Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the question that I answered it. You know, some years back in time, I said, "Well, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, I don't care." But I'm not willing to to keep on playing a game. I'm I'm certainly unhappy with. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people, a lot of guys, especially, you know, they they go along with it uh, and do something that they're unhappy with because they think that, especially once they have a family, right? They have kids, they have wife, yeah. that they're saddled with this. And there's really no way around it, so I just need to put my head down uh, for my life and, uh, and take it in order to, you know, support everybody. Right? Yeah, so. and, and this is where I really, this is why I do what I do, because mm -hmm. I, I want to be especially an inspiration to parents. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're single, it's easy. If you yeah. want to mess up your life and, you know, and just do a 9-to-5 do a job and unhappy, that's okay. It's, it's your thing. But if you are a parent, if you're a mom or a dad and you have kids that look up to you, that look up to you for guidance and being a role model. And then you show them, not by words, you know, we all use fancy words like, son, you can become whatever you want, you know, you live your dreams, my son. You know, these words pour very easily out of our mouth, also in the school system and wherever. But if you don't fill these words with life and with an authentic way of living your life but you live a life where you just really go from paycheck to paycheck and from weekend to weekend and you're not happy with that this is what your kids will perceive to be normal and that's something far beyond your own level of happiness to me is not acceptable because our kids they are still very wide open to dream big they don't have any problems to to just you know envision themselves as astronauts as as, as you know, big achievers, they have no problems with that. Right. It just happens over time if you are an uninspiring role model to them that they can lose belief in their dreams because right. they just see, you know, their daddy and their mama constantly, um, you know, uh, um, declining their own. Right. So this is why I'm so most passionate to inspire, inspire, inspire. I feel like... As a parent, you almost have the duty, you have the responsibility to live your dreams and to do something that has meaning and that is like making your heart sing, you know? Yeah. So that's why, why I'm sitting here and giving the speech. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. And, you know, another thing is, is not just having uninspiring parents, but, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the public education system. Uh, if, I mean, <laughs> you read up on it and you kind of look at it, it's almost completely designed to crush people's aspirations and, and imagination and stuff like that. Um, so that brings me to the next question I wanted to ask you about, which I'm sure a lot of people uh, are wondering. So about education, if you're on the road um, and, you know, in these different countries, what do, what do you do about uh, education or schooling? Well, the way we see it is that we are not just tourists traveling all around the world, but what we actually do is um, world schooling our our kids. So the way we see our you know our lifestyle as a traveling family is that these are educational travels we do with our family. Mm -hmm. So we do not just you know um, take off touristic attractions. You know that's actually another part that we do a lot of like social work, and we just came you know from Guatemala where we were working with different organizations to help like the locals and help the indigenous people and have the women and so we we do so that's kind of not being a normal tourist you know to mm -hmm. show our kids that grow up very privileged to have like you know parents we have you know money is no issue anymore any longer so so they grow up as rich children so mm -hmm. we won't really show them um, you know by working 
hands on with organizations in different parts of the world, especially the third world countries, that we are supposed to give back and to share and to just like help, you know, the poor and help mm-hmm. help people who are not so fortunate as we are. So that's one part. But then, you know, another rule in our family is that we visit four to five new countries each year. And when we do that, we our kids prepare by themselves for these new countries by um, doing some research about the culture, about the flora and fauna, about the language, about the history. And then when that happens, usually you come up with questions. Questions pop up if you, you know, read about a new country. And then we go to these new places and we make sure that the kids can discover the answers they have about the country for themselves. Mm -hmm. So we go there by by touching, learning, being there and not reading it from some dry school book. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is how we see that we really give education to our kids by really seeing, you know, different parts of the world. So these, we have these two parts that we do the social work. We um, really do not go as tourists, but as um, people who study, as students into the new countries. Um, and the third thing is that we, you know, there's a big community of world traveling families. It's not just us. People sometimes think there's, you know, this is weird or, you know, it's just, the Sundancers are a little weird. But there are literally like thousands and thousands of families who live a location independent lifestyle together with their kids. And um, we have created almost this movement in Germany, you know, of thousands and thousands of people. So we, we just last winter, for example, we spent um, months from starting November 2016 to Mar- till March 2017. We spent um, months and months together with people from our tribe, from our online tribe, our do what you love tribe, as I want to want to call it. And we had like 200 people, you know, and mm-hmm. mostly from Germany, Austria and Switzerland, but also from different parts of the world as an, as an international tribe. We had 200 people and from those 200 people, 100 were children. So imagine months and months together, we lived in a remote island in Thailand um, with 100 children, all homeschooled or world schooled kids, free souls, not into the system. And, um, you know, spent like months together and exploring this island, just spending time together and creating like relationships and friendships and exploring the island. And then we moved with friends to, you know, and discovered Vietnam. We were traveling like two weeks through Vietnam with another family who has four sons. We just spent, like I said, in Guatemala several months doing social work with another um, four families. It was 24 four kids all together. So we, a lot of the time we travel and explore those countries together with other families. So our kids can do this together with their friends. They're not alone or just our family, but we have lots of, the kids have lots of friends, world traveling friends. And um, so this is like, in short, I could go uh, talk an hour about education, <laughs> unschooling and you know the, the principles behind it. Maybe you have some more specific question, but this is in short how we see education for our kids happening. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I understand, you know, completely. So, you know, the unschooling method is, is what you're using and uh, you have some groups that you're able to do that with. Would you mind maybe throwing out a, 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 well, the group that you use or is that an English speaking group or in case some people in the podcast might want to uh, investigate yeah, that? Yeah, it's it. It's a do what you love tribe. If you just go on Facebook and you punch in do what you love what you tribe, okay. that's it's our international English tribe where you know we also have lots of people. We're going to meet again this winter, so okay. it's, it's already the third winter winter that you know people from our tribe, mostly families actually, uh, meet you know in some tropical location and you just hang out for months and months at the time. So I really feel this is a movement we have created. This is not just a business I have here or something. This is yeah. a movement of like-minded people changing the world that that comes together and is really sharing more than only um, some web- websites or yeah. Facebook groups. You make me want to have a kid so I can go join you. <laughs> Maybe we'll adopt somebody. Well, just go, go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I will not no, stop you, man. No. Um, so uh, now, you know, a lot of people are going to say, now I'm completely on, on the same page with you. You know, I think that it's, uh, you know, obviously it's a phenomenal education to be able to go to new cultures and stuff like that, especially with the cur- uh, curious mind of a of a uh, of a young person and learning new languages and and this type of stuff is uh, is incredible. Uh, but you know, there's going to be a lot of people that you know they're worried about the uh, you know accreditation or, or whatever. Uh, you know, they want them to be able to go into a university. And so, how does that work when you are unschooling? Well, this is also a very easy express, um, like a prejudice we have. You know, you have to see that there are literally like tens of thousands of homeschooling kids that have been not going in traditional school system since like the the 60s. So, so you know, there has been a, a long, a decade long tradition of homeschooling uh, on in many westernized countries all over the world. 
And um, what um, studies have been showing, you know, long term studies from kids that are adults now and are like all working and, and like, you know, be, turn out to become normal um, um, equation, normal um, adults, you know, mm -hmm. the long term studies show one thing very clearly that um, homeschooled kids or unschooled kids not necessarily have like, you know, better degrees or, or worse degrees, or they also have like, you know, are all just becoming doctors or they all just have become like trash mans, you know, or janitors or whatever. But what it has been showing, and this is what is everything that counts to me anyways, is that um, a, a much bigger percentage of homeschooled kids or unschooled kids, they say about themselves when they turn into adults that they do jobs they love. Mm. Do what you love after all. Have you do, do do you know that more than 50 I think it's 53% of all Germans are not satisfied with their job. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a similar num number in the United I States. I think it's more. I think like it's every, I think it was pulled at like 65 more. or something like that. There you go in the United States it might even be more. So so please can we please think about this? Is this something that we all want to accept as something normal that you that all those people have been brought up through the normal traditional Western school system. And what has it brought them? They ended up in jobs that they are not happy with. Mm -hmm. And if they don't change something about this, you're going to be uh, create like all different symptoms of unhappiness. Like you're going to get stressed out. You become, you know, will have anxiety attacks. And if you still don't change it, you very well become sick. And if you see mm -hmm. the, the, the numbers um, in the Western world of chronic diseases, and um, allergies and burnout syndrome, you know, and all those things in medication. That's another entire multi-billion dollar industry is medication. If you see all of that, please, we have to question the existing system somehow. Mm -hmm. This is working for some people, but for a lot of people, they just fall into the cracks and they end up as very unhappy adults. So, and this is the biggest difference there is to homeschooled kids. And why is it so? I have a very clear answer because homeschooled kids and unschooled kids, they are not forced. Mm -hmm. They are not so much judged. They are not so much forced into a system, you know, and taught what they have to think, what they have to learn, how they have to learn it, how they have to respond, how they have to think, you know. This is what the school system does to, 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 to young souls. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, you have to fit in the system. You have to play by the rules. You have to stand in line. You have to give the teacher what he needs from you. Mm -hmm. And there's n not so much interest what you actually want. What is your, and this is the question we ask unschooling kids is that, what are you passionate in? How can I help you to pursue your passion, to become better, to, to become a master in the things that you like to do, that you're passionate about? These, and this leads you very not naturally, you know, asking these questions yourself. What am I, what, what makes me happy? What, what yeah. do I enjoy to do? And if you're brought up with this, this for sure will, you know, lead you into, you know, be, be more happy. And then to add, to get back, make the full circle here to the question about like degrees and get to high school and like university. It's very clear here. A lot of most of the kids have very actually it's not true. So the, the long term study also shows that generally speaking, homeschool kids make better degrees than, mm. you know, the average. And why is that so? Again, because kids who do ho um, like a university degree, they do this university degree because they want yeah because it's their desire it's their decision because they want to become that doctor or whatever or that lawyer or but it's their desire and you know everybody can look into his own heart here if you have something that you truly want you're gonna you know it's you're gonna do it you're gonna get the resources you're gonna get the information to just do what you want to do yep. but you have to have the freedom to do that so Everybody can get university degree on a homeschool, homeschooled very easy. Yeah, I remember when I was in uh, college, uh, one of my best friends, he was homeschooled and a uh, really brilliant guy. He's from Russia. And he actually uh, was one of the programmers for the platform Think or Swim. Uh, he was on that team and they sold it to uh, Ameritrade when he was, I believe he was 16 years old. And so he had already, you know, helped program this this thing, made some money, and, and then he was going to college just to kind of get the degree. But he would never even go to to school. He would just show up in the tests and uh, exactly that's how it, that's how it's done. <laughs> and yep. now this is how homeschooling kids do it. Yeah, yeah, they just show up for the for the exams. They yeah. just prepare for that by themselves, and they usually, if they want to do it, make amazing degrees. What what yeah. how, what kind of degrees did he did your friend do uh, then? On, inter on... International business, and he now works for Google in London. 
So there you go. That's another great example, and um, it, it's just in alignment with tens of thousands of others. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's no, that's great. Um, and and if people are are interested in uh, looking more into that, to think that uh, I'm not crazy when I'm saying that the uh, public school system is kind of designed uh, that way, then I would really recommend the book, uh, The Underground History of American Education, by John Taylor Gatto. I know I read that book for the first time. I think the top of my head almost blew off. Have you ever read that one? No, I have oh, not because I'm really. Recommend I think this it. is more. But I heard about it. I think this this book is more about like really discovering you know all the flaws and the problems of yeah. the public school system. Correct. I understand. I'm way much more interested in my entire life. That's also where I am, problem. where I am right now, into the solutions. Yeah. So I rather would like to recommend people to talk to homeschooling, you know, or to find homeschooling, unschooling, world schooling groups on Facebook and just to rather connect with people who have a positive um, outlook and and show alternatives rather than yeah. just. I, I believe that a lot of people. Most people, these are also numbers that are rising, actually, that more and more people understand that the school system, the way it is designed and maintained now for literally like decades without any major changes to it, that this, that this is not the perfect way of education for our children. A lot yeah. of people know about this already. So if this is, it becomes more and more common knowledge that there need to be improvement to the school system, I just really would like to highlight the many solutions that are out there that are lived and practiced by tens of thousands of people. That's more my thing. Okay, great. And so, you know, we were talking about people not being uh, happy with their jobs and this type of thing. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm sure that a lot of people would agree with you and maybe they're working their job, but, you know, they they don't know how to get out of that. So how would you recommend that people that, you know, they, they would like to um, maybe do something similar to what you're doing or have their own business or, or stop uh, whatever the career or business that they're in? How do they get started to do that? How do they, you know, a lot of people have trouble making money. Well, that's, you know, that's kind of like, like also like a part of what we teach is like, you know, to help people get started with an online business. And um, the way how I see it is like, you know, all it really needs is a passion. This is, however, the fundament. You need to have some passion, some hobby, some interests that you are so happy to learn about for free that it doesn't feel like work to you. So, you know, it, it, but it can be literally anything. As long as you have a passion for something, there are always going to be people with similar passions, you know, speaking your language that don't have the knowledge you have. So whatever it is that you have, you're passionate about, you can just start blogging, start vlogging, start, start a YouTube channel and just share your knowledge about and you can share it for free, for send. And what it does, it, it will help you to just generate followers and fans and people asking you questions and commenting and stuff. And then this will put you in the position of then, you know, just listening very carefully what you kind, what kind of questions you get from people out there, and just then design some products or, or create an ebook or like a coaching service where people, where you give your people that have questions in regards to your passion, you know what it is that they want from you. So I think very often we overcomplicate things. It's you know very basic, similar. I can't break it down. You know, there's a whole more detailed system I can also share. But the basic bottom line is really, if if you have a passion, just get online and share about your passion, and you will just generate a um, you know a tribe of people of interested fans, and that then will be happy also to you know um, pay you for for um, you know um, accessing this knowledge. Yeah, what I found is that a big hurdle with that is, uh, you know, maybe people know what they want to do. I, I would say that most people, if you sit down and talk to them, they know what they should do or want to do and, you know, the, the, the steps to get there. Um, but they have trouble with the motivation part. Uh, I, I used to teach a, a blogging uh, course, and, you know, that's how I kind of started it was, you know, if you don't really want this, if you don't think you have the motivation, like you got to really, really, like I can't explain to you how much you have to want to succeed in this. You can make it, but, you know, it's not going to be easy. And I think a lot of people That's have a have hard uh, time doing that. So how uh, is there any advice you can give to people to kind of get sure. the motivation to be consistent and, and that kind of thing? For sure. I think you have to ask yourself the basic question. Are you happy where you are? Are you happy? And, and I think a lot of people in this, this like, um, no, um, is speaking about the same thing you're referring to. A lot of people just pretend that they want to change something. It just seems cool or hip or, you know, to pretend you want to be location independent and live somewhere in Costa Rica under palm trees or whatever. It, it sounds nice and you think, part of you think you should be wanting that. But you are quite happy with the chains you have put around your neck. 
Mm. And I'm, I'm a little provoking here, but I think it's important to make this point and to get really clear for people listening to this right now to which group they actually belong. Are you the group, the one group who is just dreaming about something that feels nice, you know, while you just go into your regular work every morning? Or are you these kind of persons who really want to change something? You must be really so unhappy or so driven to change something about your situation that your fear for the unknown, the fear for failing and the fear for, you know, all these negative things your mind makes up, that this fear is not half as strong as your desire to just change the situation you're in. Mm -hmm. So it really comes back down to how happy or unhappy are you with the situation and that's you know that's a base of motivation and then arising out of this if you're just unhappy enough with with your situation I'd like everybody to just create a positive vision mm -hmm. for how would you like your life to be and make this very vivid and very like feel the breeze the tropical warm breeze going through your hair while you sit in a or lay in a hammock um, that is like um, put in between two palm trees on a tropical beach. Envision that breeze and envision the smells or, you know, how would you be waking up in your dream life? With whom would you be waking up? Where would you have breakfast? What would you be working? So to paint this in very vivid colors. And because that is the second part of the motivation that can just really keep you going, that must keep you going in the times where you don't feel like it or it's like, you know, you... You, you reach a bump in the road, that all will happen, you know. But if you have the motivation right, if you know that you don't want to stay where you, wanna, where you are at right now and you have this amazing vision where you want to go, this is what keeps you, keeps you moving. So that's one part, you know. The other part is for sure follow a system, you know, get a, get a teacher, get some training courses, get a coach, get somebody who leads you the way, who shows you the step and look for somebody who is where you want to be. Don't f try to figure out this all by yourself. That's the second part. And the third part is um, find a group of like-minded people. You know, get in our Do What You Love tribe or, or find people who have similar visions, who have similar values, and just, you know, uh, um, surround yourself with some new people. Because one thing I also promise you, if you're going to start this down to this new path and you think about letting go of this shitty job and just, you know, starting as an entrepreneur, a lot of people in your surrounding will not support you. Moms and dads, usually, if you tell them, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to uh, let go of the secure job to start an online business and become a blogger. I want to see um, um, the person, or there might be some persons who get support from their parents, but a lot of us will not get the support we hope for. So you got to make yourself independent from this, again, by having high motivation so, and, and having a group. So those three things, I believe, are crucial. You know, get the motivation up by knowing where you do not want to be and creating a, a vivid vision where you want to be. Get a teacher you can follow, a system you can follow, and get a group of people um, you can then rely on and look for, for support when you don't feel like it. Those three things. Yeah, I, that, you know, the visualization stuff, uh, you know, I, I know when I first was reading about that kind of thing, I thought it sounded kind of silly. Um, but, I, you know, I could tell you it, it really is powerful, you know, when you get your your attitude and, you know, your, your vision uh, going in the, in the right direction. And, uh, you know, you, you again, you go out and like you're saying, find other people that will support you and uh, other, you know, successful people in the field and, and you surround yourself with those. It's just uh, you can really change your life very quickly. I mean, it, it's amazing uh, in this day and age and in the information age that I've found is just how quickly um, you, you can just change your life. You know, you could start a business in the afternoon and uh, all of a sudden, you know, figure out a way to get in front of a bunch of people and. Uh, who knows? You know, it's just it's. Uh, there's That's so right. Much I, I always, I always like to say, you know, you, all you need is a great idea and a smartphone, and you can reach a billion people. <laughs> right. But I'm also touching on another subject that was the motivation we've been talking right. about. Mm -hmm. In in my belief, also coming from total poverty and being like 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 you said before, fifteen twenty thousand dollars in depth and having no support and no, you know nobody, no education, nothing of that sort. You know, um, what is what what has brought me to this place where I am right now and having completely changed this and having never to worry about money uh, um, anymore at all you know is not the right website it's also just partly the motivation which is really coming from the right mindset so I believe that 80 and I'm, I keep on increasing those numbers you know from month to month I have the feeling I would say you know like 80 if not 90% of success in business and in life is due to the right mindset to the right attitude 
It's not the marketing. It's not the website presentation, the colors you use, the fonts you use. You know, it, it, this all doesn't matter. It's really all the right mindset. And if you have, and this is something we all have to work on because usually we are not brought up with an abundant uh, mindset. The biggest killer that, again, I root back to our school system is the, the biggest root for, of evil for entire mankind. And that is the, the biggest lie also. And it is, I am not good enough. Mm. That's engraved in us um, through our school system because there, you know, our history in the school system because there's always somebody who's better than you. And, you know, as everything is about winning, you know, like on elbows and winning and becoming better and like you have to improve. That's another thing they taught, teach you in school. You have to learn something. You have to make something out of yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, and all you have to, you know, you have to become better. You have to overcome some weaknesses. You have to, like, you know, have to change. So what this all implies is the lie that right now you're not good enough because there's more to learn. There's, you know, the mistakes you have to overcome. There are people better than you, right? Because right now you're not good enough. And mm-hmm. if you believe this, and very a lot of us, I believe almost everybody on earth has this to one or the other degree. If you have this mindset of I'm not good enough, you know, it's going to be very hard to succeed in business. So you need to be lo- able to, to look into this. You need to be mm-hmm. able to look into this, to face this, to see, um, you know, to, to, to become friend with it. That's right. a big part. A lot of a lot of us, you know, um, we are resisting this not being not good enough or being not complete enough or whatever. And then with that resisting, you just keep it alive. You, there's no movement. You just lock it in a cellar and you just try to throw away the key, you know. And all it does in the in the cellar is just scream louder each year. Hmm. So what we have to do is to get the key, go down there and hug it. And, you know, embrace it and understand that this is just part of ourself. And this is this is my realization I had over the last years where I'm also like a, a German guy and I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a dude. And I, you know, um, like, I don't know, I'm, I, I used to be a fighter as well and all those things. So I always had the feeling I had to fight those fears. I had to overcome them. I had to do something. I had to like, you know, work with them. I had like, you know, all this male fighting, working solution driven attitude towards my fears and towards my I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. What I realized over the last years is that this is nothing that can be fought. This is nothing that I have to fight. What I realized is, man, this is part of who I am. This is part of me. You know, and, and, and so I, I became almost like a friend with it because I understand now this is, you know, again, this is, I don't have to overcome or fight this. This is just part of me. But what this realization more soft approach did is that right now, whenever, and it pops up daily, still it does, you know, so it's still there. I cannot get rid of it and I don't have to anymore. But when it comes, it shows up again. It's more like the attitude I have towards my, my fears and my I'm not good enough and whatever. It's like, oh, there you are again. My old friend, just come here in my arms. You know what? Let's give you a hug. And you know what? Now we move forward together, Mm -hmm. arm in arm. Right. You see where where I'm getting with this. So I just I just move forward regardless of my fear. I don't this fear and my not being not good enough is no longer having power over my decisions where I'm going to take my next step. So I think this is a big realization I felt felt like sharing. Yeah, I, uh, it kind of reminds me. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same. But it reminds me of the quote from uh, Steve Jobs where he said the, the biggest realization he had in his life was when he, he looked around and realized that everything that had been invented around him was made by people with similar intelligence to him. And, you mm-hmm. know, that he can, <laughs> he can do, you know, whatever he wants if he puts his, his mind in the right direction. And that really changed his life. It sounds like a, a similar type of thing. And another thing I wanted to say is, you know, we were talking about before as far as the motivation and getting yourself in the right direction and mindset. Um, now, you know, with all the resources that we have available, uh, I just did a uh, podcast before this one about crowdfunding. Um, you know, m- money is not the problem. Uh, you have all kinds of different expertise in different areas. If you want to do something, you can put together the right team. You can, the, you know, th- there's nothing holding you back other than just, you know, leadership and the motivation to get it done. So. That's right, yeah, yeah, and the right mindset that you are allowed to do it, that you can do it, that you don't need more education or a better camera or a new haircut or any of that <laughs> sort. You can just get started right, right away. You know, sometimes right. those excuses just pop up in very mysterious and um, uh, interesting ways for, yeah. for people and for all of us, including myself, obviously. Yeah. Well, I wanted to uh, talk to you about this, the, you know, the idea of 
you don't need a home to be happy. I saw that you have a YouTube video about that. And it sounds like you are living uh, very similar to the way I'm living. And also, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with James Altucher. He also talks a lot about that kind of, um, Mm -hmm. you know, living in in different uh, rentals and stuff like that. And that's the same thing that I do as well. Um, so I don't know if you could t- uh, talk a little about, uh, about that, how you go about doing that, finding places, and, and uh, why do you not need a, a home to be happy? Well, there's this saying, you know, home is where your heart is. And isn't that true? You know, home is where your heart is, and my heart is with my family. So I'm home wherever my family is. But I just want to flip this around and just, you know, um, use some different words to just show some people, you know, who are open for this, um, if, you know, the opposite really makes really sense, because I question this. So does it really make sense that you consider, you know, you have like a, like a, like a hill, a muddy hill somewhere, and you just put like four concrete walls on that hill. And then all of a sudden you say, well, this is where my heart is now. This is where I belong. Just on, a, on, on, on some hill and you just put a, like a concrete box on that thing. And then all of a sudden that's you. Or this is where you define yourself. Why even? You know, it, it's, it's really groundbreaking to just ask this question back. Why, why, does, why would this even make sense? <laughs> to right. me, I don't understand why, why you put everything, your entire life, onto this concrete box. You just locate somewhere randomly. There's no plan or no, like, I don't know, spiritual alignment or, I don't know, soul searching on, on that. It's like, you know, just you just claim some concrete box somewhere and say, well, this is it now. So... Does this really make sense? I'm, I'm, I'm doubting this, or at least I want to question this. It can yeah. be for some people, but in my experience, you know, as we travel so much, it literally takes maybe half an hour to an hour to claim a new home. Mm-hmm. I don't need like two decades for this, but I go into a hotel room or into a rental place and I put my, or we all put our toothbrush in the bathroom and, you know, our five piece of clothes somewhere in a cupboard, you know, in, in a cupboard somewhere on a shelf. And I don't know, our blender in the kitchen we always travel with and that's it that's home then it goes so quickly and people what's the blender moving, you have we have um you know we used to be traveling with the vitamix or a blend tech but now we have a um, nutri bullet nutri bullet is like oh, a is small that, version of it i just sold my yeah. vitamix cuz i had to move and i couldn't bring it, it broke my heart i love it, that thing yeah exactly we we, we, travel, we were traveling with the vitamix for a long time but then we replaced it um just last travel where we really were trying to minimize so drastically you, we were traveling mm-hmm. um to the nutri bullet the small nutri bullet okay I'll have to take a look at yeah, it. so Anyways, so we so, went with, yeah. with with two the last travel 8 months um we just started last um, november and we just came back to costa rica a couple of weeks ago 8 months we did with we started with two suitcases eight people mm. so just just that's some minimalism but um again the, the, the concept of having a home, having a house, um, that can be changed so quickly. Everybody who has ever been moving into a new place maybe can feel this. If you have not been moving with like 20,000 boxes, but you know, or if you, you know, you go on a holiday rental or something, it just goes so quick that this you consider this home. So this is what how I feel about it. And we, it also has a lot to do with, I believe, with letting go, with not holding on to things, which we are really not big at in at all and which also I believe is part of our success that we always welcome the new we embrace the new and the um, and we are happy to let go you know people always ask why don't you just stay in Costa Rica forever it's beautiful say yes it's beautiful here but you know there are another 20 or 50 tropical paradise locations that are at least equally as beautiful and that needs to be discovered Yep. So just because you're in a, in a good space doesn't mean that you cannot just let it go and find a possibly even more beautiful place that is more in alignment with you having changed also over time and having different needs and stuff. Right. Yeah. The way I look at it is, um, you know, as, as far as real estate goes, um, if you're buying it for an investment, then there's obviously, you know, the, there's a, a certain way that you want to look at that as far as return on investment. Uh, but... You don't want to live in your investment. If you're living in a house, that's not a, that's mm. not an investment, and so what, what that is a depreciating uh, asset. So you know that's you more liken that to a car, and uh, there's nothing wrong with buying a car, uh, but it you know it's not an investment. It's it's just something that you enjoy. So you know if you if the peace of mind of owning a house uh, is very important to you, um, the, and you have the money to do it, then uh, then do it. But it's you know it's, yep. I don't see it at, that it can be justified as a as a good financial decision. But uh, you know I know a lot of people that would disagree with me. But uh, you know I, I especially in in this day and age when it's so easy 
uh, to rent uh, places and move around and uh, things like that. Uh, I mean, I find uh, Air- Airbnb to be great. And um, what I what I wanted to ask you about, since you you know you concentrate a lot about eating. Uh, and uh, diet and stuff. So how do you uh, how do you manage your diet while you're moving around like that? Well, this is uh, if you want to eat healthy on the road, there always comes a level of preparation in in the game. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. If you everybody who ever went on an airplane knows, or I hope you know that um, the food you get on airplanes is not at its best, not not as good as it could be, in comparison to some amazing organic locally health food store. So um, if we, especially if we do air travels, we, we usually prepare. So that means like we have like, I don't know, like dehydrated crackers and, um, you know, some dates and some nuts possibly. And um, maybe we even pre- prepare some dressing. So we can, you know, in every airplane or every airport, you always can buy just salad. So, um, but the dressing usually also is not so good or is filled with sugar and salt and, and, and I don't like, like chemicals and stuff. So we um, bring our own dressing. We have some, that's what we do. And, you know, have some fruits, so obviously some, I don't know, some raw muesli bars or, so we prepare. That's, yeah. that's how we do it. Yeah, I've been trying to, you know, it, it's, it's kind of difficult sometimes. It matters how, how quickly you're moving because, you know, it's hard to cook, um, you know, because you, you kind of have to accumulate spices and, and all kinds of uh, different things like that um, over time. And then you have to move. So then, you know, what are you going to do with that? Uh, I've, uh, what I've been doing lately is just doing kind of more uh, takeout. Uh, I'll go to places and, and order a lot. Um, and then just take it home, <laughs> and so I don't even yeah. you know, really need to cook, um, and that's m- much less expensive in you know Latin America or something like that. You can afford to do that. And it's actually uh, cheaper than than going out and buying everything you need to all the time, especially for a single guy. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, I think it's a little different if you have a big, big family yeah. to look after. Sure. But um, I, I'm 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 still with you. We have usually also like you know some superfoods with us. Some I lose some supplements and some protein powders you know we all do do lots of exercise my sons and me and you know everybody in the family so um but uh, this is not such a big deal it's just preparation right. i guess and 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 then also it's a question of how high your standards are ours mm-hmm. are pretty high and we still manage to travel all around the world right okay and um you know a lot of people w- would you know be terrified of of bringing their children anywhere in latin america uh, how do you go about? Well, what, first of all, what would you you know say about that? Is that a legitimate concern? And how do you go about picking safe uh, and good locations, with hotels and stuff for, with your children? This is especially a concern for American people. For some reason, I don't know. You American folks are seem to be so afraid of other everything that is not American, <laughs> right. um, which I really wanted to question because I felt honestly way much more um, endangered. You know, I don't know in parts of Los Angeles or New York or in Miami at night than yeah. I'm feeling here at my beautiful beach in Costa Rica. Right. So I believe that the crime rate, and you have to see how many people get shot in the United States, and how you know, uh, and public people get shot in in Europe or something, is is, is I I you know it, I've I, but this is in general with all fears. Fears mm. are very often, if you really boil it down, are very irrational. There's nothing too logic about fears at all. You sometimes fear the strangest things, and if you really dig deeper, you just realize, man, this doesn't make any sense at all. So I, I don't know, you know, I wouldn't go to Somalia with my kids or to Afghanistan or something like this, you know, but um, um, there are just a few countries out of the 220 or something we have on this earth that I would not consider going with my kids. Um, we have been in so many countries already and um, I never felt like endangered hmm. nowhere. I cannot think of one situation where I felt like, oh man, this, let's get out of here. I recall one thing when I was... But this was 1999 or something when I was traveling with Katie through South America. We were in Ecuador and there was all of a sudden close to Colombia, there was a roadblock. And some young guys, teenage kids with machetes and they came in the bus and they wanted all the guys to get out of the bus. And we had to like put our hands on the bus and they were like looking for, I don't know, looking for drugs or for money or whatever. Or not for money. I didn't have money bunch there anyways. But it was the only thing I could think of that was like a little dodgy. Right. Aside from this, I always feel a little scared when I get pulled over from some American cop in the good old United States of America, because they pull you over and they always have their hand uh, touching the gun and they sound nice, but there is always like a um, 
I feel almost threatened almost if I, somebody pulls me over in the United States. Very like, you know, that's for, for, for intense. Yeah, that's for security. I feel more threatened and insecure being pulled over by a cop in the United States than being here in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, they all about protecting the tourists because they know the country runs on tourists. They have a tourist police here. It's an own agency. It's just to, they're just here for protecting tourists. Um, so that's you know what I have to say in regards to security. Yeah, that's funny that what you were just saying about the the uh, tourist police because uh, here where I am in Mexico, uh, you know they have same thing. No? They, yeah, they have the, the tourist police. A lot of times uh, in tourist areas, they'll have uh, the federal the federales and who would, which have you know big guns and stuff. And, and the funny part is that they're supposed to be there to make the tourists feel safe. But a lot of times the Americans, they see that and they freak out. That's the opposite effect. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, well, that's just the way it is, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, to what you're saying about the United States, sure, you know, there's there's a lot of pockets, the ones that you mentioned uh, in in big cities and specifically in, in smaller areas of big cities that are pretty bad in the United States. But uh, a lot of the United States has has little to no crime and, and no... Uh, police interview, you know, it's just not the places that usually go to, which is the, the majority of, of the state. So, you know, that's that's why, it, you know, it's so anyways, um, they still have the scary cops. If you ask me, yeah. whenever I get pulled over from a cop <laughs> in the United States, it doesn't make me feel too well, good. Where, where uh, have you been? Well, in many places, in okay. as well in New York, in Delaware, and um, in South East and the Southwest of the states, in, in many places. But outside the cities, I mean, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside the true. cities, it's a little bit. That's true. Outside yeah. the cities, it's it's a different thing. Yeah. But you know, uh, millions or I don't know, a hundred million people live in the cities in the United yeah. States, or right. I'm not close to that number. All right, and uh, so what I wanted to ask you also also is, you know, that now that you've been to how many uh, different places is it that have you counted? No, I stopped okay. counting, but it must be several dozens. Okay. I, I, so I was asked this l lately. I should make a list, maybe like 40 or 30. Um, I, I don't know. All right. And um, what are some of the countries or cities that you would recommend to people uh, that are considering their first trip or, or uh, well, the ones to visit well, and the ones to, that might consider to relocate to? It, it, it again, being really like a, a global citizen, it depends very much, and not speaking as a German or European, but as a world citizen, it really depends on where you come from. You know, we have so many American friends and, and, and uh, um, you know, people from the United States, I would rather recommend going them, for example, to Costa Rica. Mm. or to go Because it's interesting, you know, one of our other home and also spiritual homes is Thailand. But for some reason, this Southeast Asia thing for Americans seem to be very threatening, or I don't know, they're very afraid of this because it's so far away from the United States and so different. Um, however, for all Europeans, you see, meet a lot of Europeans in Europe. And if you ask me, you know, if you don't consider these national um, fears that are not really based on anything, I feel it's just really um, random to me. Um, but still, that's overall what I encountered, that people in the United States don't really see Thailand as a, as a beautiful um, dream location. I would still... If, if you don't say this, you know, if you don't take this into consideration, I would say Thailand because Thailand is, is cheap. It's very safe. It's a Buddhist country. They don't have, you know, coming from the United States, they don't have locks on their doors. They, they don't even have doors. Mm. They, they have no fences. You know, in this resort we stay, there was just, a, you know, the center of the resort, the reception. They had their computers and the, even the till was standing there. It was open all night and the light was burning and there was no security guard. So this is Thailand, you know, the people don't have doors, they don't need doors, it's like you don't steal, you just don't do it, you know, there are no, no fences, no, very, I feel very secure, it's very, like, um, mind shifting to see how open this culture is, and like, you know, how there are no guards, that you don't really see, you know, like, people with machine guns, like you see in Central America, almost everywhere, on, like in Mexico, like you, where you are. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one reason that it's very open, very secure, very safe. I feel it's cheap. But then it is, to me, one of the best organized countries for tourists. So you can go in each and every hotel and they will organize you transportation to each and every place in Thailand where you want to go. And they, either way, it's a private transportation with a, with a van you rent or public transportation, bus, boat, whatever. I don't know how, how they organize this, but there is like a countrywide system that is helping, you know, all the hotel owners or bungalow owners, whatever, to just organize those tours. Mm -hmm. So it's so easy. No matter where you are, you can always organize a taxi or they're called called like um, the tuk-tuks, like so, the yeah. three, three yeah, um, those, those things. And you can always organize transportation. Then on top of this, 
each resort you go to, you know, you really get these, you know, these beautiful postcard image resorts almost on every island in Thailand where you have like a resort with, with um, bungalows directly sitting by the beach and a restaurant next to it. So what I'm saying is like you don't have to cook. You, you're not cooking in, in Thailand. You always there's street food. There is restaurants. Very, very, very cheap. So you can have a, a, an amazing lifestyle living by the beach, having travel organized and having food brought to you to the room for a very small amount of money. And they're very child friendly. And so to me, Thailand is one is one country, especially to Europeans and mm -hmm. Germans. I recommend because they're open for Thailand. Again, to the people in the United States, they don't like this advice so much. So I say go to Costa Rica. It's also very safe. And or the Bahamas is mm -hmm. more. Up well, more. tell us about Costa Rica. Uh, you know, yeah. what, you seem to spend a lot of time there. How how is that? And who yeah. you who? What type of person would you recommend Costa Rica to? Again, Costa Rica is. Um, we have lots of Americans here in Costa Rica, and they own also big parts of the country because they've been buying so much property here. Um, but Costa Rica is safe. It's the safe. They call it the Switzerland of Central America. So it's it's very safe, as it's again, lots of Americans are here, and the people appreciate um, having so many tourists here that pay for everything. It's safe. They have a good educational system. Um, I don't know. People are friendly. There is this index, um, happypeople.org. And um, since years, Costa Rica is leading that index as supposedly here live uh, the, um, the happiest people on earth. So, you know, people are happy people. That is, again, for families. You know, I'm speaking as a father here to a family. They love children so much. You know, coming from the Western world, United States or Germany, where I come from, this is almost like um, like an insult if you tell people like, man, for me, families first and then, you know, I work. It's in the United States and Germany, everywhere, it's the other way around. The first thing is work, making money, your career, and your family has to fit somehow around that. That's one reason why we became experts, because to me, I'm speaking now to you, and I'm, you know, this amazing business owner and business coach and million dollar business, blah, 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 blah. But this is for me on the fifth or maybe sixth um, um, rank in my personal best off list. Number one, two, three, and four is family, or five and six, whatever. I'm, I'm here, and also I, that I don't work much because I love to be with my family every day. I'm with my kids. I'm playing by the beach. You know, we're doing tours, and we travel all around the world, basically, to, so I can be with my kids. And this is uh, in Costa Rica. A lot of people can feel me, and I have support me here because they don't care about work so much. You know, they. If they don't feel like working, they don't work. They just come the next day, which also causes problems on the other end. You know, as you cannot really rely so much like you can in the United States on, you know, uh, and like the services that you purchase for to be done the same day. But it teaches you the Pura Vida lifestyle, as they call it here. Pura Vida means pure life, and they say this for everything. Yeah, it means like goodbye and good day and sorry and Pura Vida. And that is like the, the one slogan that is describing Costa Rica. It's just, you know, it's easy, it's relaxed, it's for families, it's like relax, you just lay around, do nothing. I love this, coming from Germany where everything is just about working. Um, you know, they have a big variety of, you know, of nature, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, um, I think like almost like over the half of the country is natural reserve area. They have as well as deserts, as high mountains, as beaches, as rainforests, as everything here. And what I also like, they have no army since 1948. There has no army, no soldier mm -hmm. in this country. No mother ever lost a husband, a brother, brother or, a, or um, somebody in a war. And that's a big thing for me, being a 100% uh, pacifistic um, attitude. Um, and also, as a last thing, they are into alternative energy. So I believe the last half year they have been managing to um, to create all 100% of their energy from renewable sources. No atomic plant, no um, coal, no nothing. It's uh, they do it with sun and, and and water here. So these are many reasons why I love it here so okay. much. Now, uh, if somebody is uh, interested in um, learning more about you, maybe uh, taking part in your uh, online business school or just getting some more information, uh, how would they get started? Well, we have free training. So, so I would recommend anybody who doesn't know about us just get some free training. You know, we have some free video series and stuff how you can, you know, use our system to just become location independent. You, you know, with a business you, your heart is fully invested in uh, by going to our website. Just just check us out on thesundancefamily.com. That's our main website. I guess you're going to be linking it somewhere around the, oh, yeah. the show notes or something. Mm -hmm. And from there, you know, we have the free training for people who want to become location independent. But then also I want to mention that I'm very passionate filmmaker. 
So I'm really I'm vlogging about our life as a location independent family on YouTube. You're gonna be you know, and I'm I'm really good. I do this since many many years, and we have like 70,000 subscribers internationally. So um, you gotta check out our YouTube channel and see us and see my family, see my wife, and see my ki kids, you know, in in real life. And also I love to do take photographs. So check out our Instagram, and I do daily Insta stories there. And then like I said, free trainings uh, for people who want to become location independent on the sunnesfamily.com. Okay, great. Well, I got a lot of stuff going on. Well, I've really um, enjoyed this conversation, and uh, I think that the listeners will as well. So uh, I will definitely link all that stuff to the show notes today. And uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, and I hope we can keep in touch. Thank you so much. All the best. Um, and I enjoyed myself tremendously here. Thank you, James. And to everybody, do what you love, guys. Life is short. There go you go. <laughs> all right. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us for the Borderless Podcast, traveling, investing, and living beyond borders.